harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me, send me. Life on the Edge will enable you to be an effective harvester for the Lord. We now invite you into our classroom to come experience life. We're so glad that you could be back here in the classroom with us at the Lay Institute for Evangelism. You have turned on your television today to watch the 10th study of our Life on the Edge series. The title for this study is The Millennium. Does anybody know what millennium stands for? Thousand, thousand years. That's absolutely right. The millennium is a thousand year period and it's a literal time period. It's not a prophetic time period other than the fact that it's in the future and we know that it's going to happen. If you'll take a look at your screen there, you'll see at the top the title of the study is Millennium. The code for marking it in your Bibles is the letter M that stands for Millennium. The purpose of this study is to show that the Millennium begins at the second coming of Jesus. It is a period of judicial review that culminates in the eternal destruction of the wicked. So the purpose of this study today is to show that the thousand-year period begins at the second coming of Jesus. And it ends a thousand years later where the wicked are destroyed for eternity. Now this Bible study is centered on Christ just like all of our other studies have been. This way, it says, Christ allows His followers the opportunity to review the decisions that He and the Father have made. He allows us to see that He is fair and just in all of His ways. You and I serve a God that is willing to allow us to look at everything He... all of the decisions that He has ever made concerning man or any other thing for that matter. God's life is so open... God wants you and I to have all doubt removed as to the decisions that He has made. Because you remember when we started in our third Bible study, the Bible study on the great controversy, that Satan was insinuating that God was not fair, God was not just. And God is going to allow His character to be vindicated in that thousand year period. What you see there on the slide now are the references in this Bible study called the Millennium. There are 17 references there. And this Bible study should take, should take approximately an hour to give. So that's about how long we're going to be here today. So it won't take up all of your day or all of your night if you're watching this at home. Just a little bit of time. So we're glad you're here with us. We will go ahead and go now to our... Uh, the next slide asks, tells us that there are two classes or two groups of people that will be resurrected. And thank you, Tom. Tom has just reminded me, and so has Shalita. I see two, two people doing like this. That's an indication that we need to pray before we study the Bible. So let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to be here at life, to be studying your word. We know that when your word is studied, that your spirit is poured out. And we thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity here in the classroom and those of us at home, the opportunity to study your word right now. We ask that you will open our minds so that we can understand it, so that we can take it into our hearts and love it. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So there are two classes of people or two groups of people that are resurrected and so we're just going to look at that right now. We're not going to say when they're resurrected. We'll look at that in just a moment. But we're going to go to John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. We'll let Mike read this for us. Now, Mike, let's suppose that uh, I'm new to the Bible. This is the first time that I've uh, turned on the television and they're, they're watching this program. How do I get to the New Testament book of John? Help me get there. Uh, well, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. It's about... 
three quarters of the way through the Bible. All right. Well, I got Matthew here. Now okay, where do so I go? You go to the right. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. Okay. And we're going where in John? John chapter 5 and verse 28 and 29. That's good. Now, you see how Mike walked us right to John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. You'll have to do that when you give Bible studies because you'll study with people that don't know anything about the Bible, but you're the one that God has chosen to share this with them. And maybe God has chosen Mike to share this passage with us today. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Okay, so how many, Mike, go ahead and keep that. How many resurrections or how many classes of people do we see resurrected? Two. What are the two groups? The righteous and the wicked. The righteous and the wicked. So does everybody see that? We have two groups of people that are resurrected. One group is called the righteous and one group is called the wicked. Let's look at this at another reference. The Bible tells us in the mouth of two or three witnesses, the truth is established. So, Roberto, we're going to go to Acts chapter 24. So, for those of you at home, those of you here, you're just going to turn one book to the right from John, and you'll be in Acts chapter 24 and verse 15. Acts 24 and verse 15, Roberto. 15. Yeah, Acts 24. Verse 15. I have, hope, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Okay, so Roberto, how many groups of people do you see resurrected in that verse? Two. Two. A group called the just and a group called the what? Unjust. The unjust. So there are two classes or two groups of people that are resurrected. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. My question now, Tom, is when are these groups of people resurrected? When are they resurrected? And we'll go to our next reference for that. And there's, well, you have a slide. It says, when do these resurrections take place? And then our next slide takes us to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 15, 16, and 17. Now, this should sound very familiar to us because in our last program, we studied the second coming and we read these references right here. So the T section of the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 15 and going through 17. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be forever with the Lord. So go back up into verse 16. It said there, and the dead in... It, well, let's just start at the beginning. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise what? First. first. Now, in the context, if we just said first right there, considering the question I just asked, you would say, well, the dead in Christ must rise first before anybody else does. But in the context, that first word is simply talking about the righteous that were dead are resurrected and meet the Lord in the air before the righteous living meet the Lord in the air. It's also important that we meet the Lord where? In the air. You remember in our second coming study, we learned that Jesus will never put his feet on the foul earth again. Not since he has gone back to heaven and been completely glorified. So the Bible tells us right here in verse 16 that the dead in Christ will rise. What is the event that the dead in Christ rise? Say it louder. Second. Second coming of Jesus. That's absolutely right. So our question was, when do these resurrections take place? Well, the resurrection of the righteous or the resurrection of those that died in Christ takes place at the second coming of Jesus. Does that make sense, Bill? All right, so you'll see here on the screen, I simply have a graphic. Just have a little line there with an arrow pointing at it. It says, this, at the second coming, the righteous... Are raised. So if you and I should pass away before Jesus returns, 
What res- when will you and I want to be resurrected? At the second coming, when Jesus returns. So let's go to our next question. What happens to the wicked at the second coming of Jesus? What happens to the wicked at the second coming of Jesus? And Jessica, we're going to ask you to read for us 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. So we don't have to turn very far at all, do we? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Okay, now who is it, according to verse uh, 9, it says... No, verse 8, rather. It says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is it that doesn't obey God and doesn't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Who is that? That's the unrighteous or the wicked. Now, notice in verse 9, it says, Who shall be punished? Who is this talking about? The wicked, the wicked will be punished with everlasting destruction from the what? From the presence of the Lord. Now, when is it that the Lord's presence is revealed? It's at the second coming. So the very event where the righteous are raised and the righteous living go to heaven, the very event, that very same time, is when the wicked are what? Destroyed. That's when the wicked... Are slain. Now, Jeremiah, an Old Testament prophet, tells us this in a much more vivid way. So let's go to our next reference. We're going to Jeremiah chapter 25, reading verses 30 through 33. Jeremiah 25, we will ask Shalita to read this for us. Jeremiah 25, verses 30 through to 33. Okay. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation, and he, sh- he shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout. He shall give a what? A shout. He shall give a what? A shout. Now the Bible told us in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven With a what? Shout. Shout. So the event that is talked about here when the Lord is shouting is the second coming of Jesus. That's that's how we know this is the second coming of Jesus because the Lord is shouting. When is it that the Lord shouted in 1 Thessalonians 4? At His second coming. So here, let's just keep reading now. We know from the context that this is talking about the second coming of Jesus. So let's keep reading. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Okay, stop right there again. He shall give those that are wicked to the what? To the sword. You remember in our last Bible study, Our Bible study about the second coming, the very last reference that we read was Revelation 19. Does anybody remember the verse? It was verse 21. I'll read it for you real quick here. Revelation 19, verse 21 says, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now, who was it that the birds ate? The wicked people. So the sword kills what people? The wicked people. So over here in Jeremiah 25, the Lord is shouting. The wicked people are being slain. And what does it say in verse 32 and 33? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. Okay, stop right there. 
who is the slain of the Lord on that day? Who are they? The wicked, that's right. Now keep reading. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Okay, so the wicked will not be lamented. What does that mean? To be lamented. Mourned. Cried over or mourned. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Why is it that the wicked on the, at the second coming are not lamented, gathered, or buried? There is nobody here. Just notice on your screen there. At the second coming of Jesus, the righteous are raised, the wicked are slain. There's nobody on the face of the earth to cry for them. There's nobody to gather them together. And there's nobody to bury them. So it's at the same event, the same event, the righteous are resurrected and the wicked are what? The wicked are slain. Now, when you give this Bible study, do exactly what you see here on the screen. What we've started is a chart. And this chart, simply, it's going to extend from one end of the screen to the other end of the screen. And we're just going to add things as we go through. But what we've got to do now is we're going to go to the book of Revelation. I believe that's our next reference. Is that right? Are we going to Revelation? Well, let's ask this question. What happens to Satan at the second coming of Jesus? What happens to Satan at the second coming of Jesus? Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1, 2, and 3. And Bill, if you can read this for us. Now, some of you may see Bill stand up during class. He's got a hip that, that sort of gets tired on him, so you may see him standing in the back at some point, but that's all right. He's still here with us. Verses 1, 2, and 3, Bill. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain, in his hand, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Okay, stop right there. Bill, let me ask you a question. What is the job of the devil right now? To tempt us. To, to tempt us, to deceive us. That's right. To get us to sin, right? So here the devil, that old serpent, Satan, is going to be bound for how long according to verse 2? A thousand years. For a thousand years. So Satan is bound. His job right now is to tempt people. Read verse 3. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. There's so much in that verse 3, isn't there? That verse 3 says, And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more. So there comes a point in time where Satan is no longer able to deceive people. What point in time is that? When who's not alive? When the people that will listen to Satan are no longer alive. And when the people that chose not to listen to Satan are now off of this planet, they met the Lord in the air, and now they're in heaven. It is at that moment that Satan is bound, notice this, by his chains of circumstance. When there's nobody to tempt. Notice that in verse 3. It says that he should deceive the nations no more. The point in the future when Satan cannot deceive the nations anymore is when Satan is bound. But also at the end of verse 3, notice what it said. And it says he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So that thousand years begins when there's no one to tempt. So it begins at the second coming of Jesus. It goes for a thousand years. And at the end of that thousand years, Satan is going to be loosed out of his prison. What does that mean? There will be people there to tempt. That's absolutely right. But the wicked were slain at the second coming of Jesus. We're going to find out later on in this study that the wicked are going to be resurrected. And that's how Satan gets out of the predicament that he is in. So there it said simply that this angel casts him into a bottomless pit. Now this has a, a connotation. Some people will read this and they'll say, wow, that must be a deep hole. But the word that is used here by John the Revelator 
When he writes in Revelation chapter 20, bottomless pit, and Revelation chapter, that was verse 1, and then in verse 3, bottomless pit, he is using the language from the Septuagint out of Genesis chapter 1. Now notice there on your screen, you see this graphic. The bottomless pit in Greek is abusos. If you and I were to look in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, in the Septuagint or the Greek translation of the Old Testament, we would notice in verse 2 that darkness was upon the face of the deep. That word for deep in the Septuagint or the Greek translation of the Old Testament is abusos. The very same word that is used in Revelation chapter 20 verse 1 and Revelation chapter 20 verse 3. This is a description of the earth after Jesus' second coming. Now notice this on your screen. Satan is bound by his chains of circumstance here on this desolate earth. Now we're going to show this in our next reference. Let's go to our next reference, which is Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse Isaiah, Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23 through 27. And Mrs. Gloria, if you could read this for us. I'm going to interrupt you a little bit during this, all right? I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. In the heavens they had no light. Okay, now Mrs. Gloria, what does this sound like? Like the grave or something? It sounds like it was prior to creation, doesn't it? All right, so, so right here when we start reading this, we think to ourselves, oh, well, this is just talking about creation, but keep reading. Remember, the context is as important as the verse you want to pull information out of. So keep reading. Give us the context, Mrs. Gloria. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of heaven had fled. Okay, stop right there. So evidently there were men, and there were what? Birds. But now even the birds are gone. Keep reading. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down, and at the presence of the Lord, by His fierce anger... Okay, stop right there. All the cities were broken down by the what? Presence of the Lord. And when does the Lord appear in all of His glory? At the second coming. So the event here is the second coming. The birds are going to be gone. There's no men left. It's describing the condition of the earth after the second coming of Jesus. Then it said there in verse 26... The cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by His fierce anger. What's another word for anger? Wrath. When is God's wrath poured out? Before the second coming or after the second coming? It's before the second coming and He comes at the end of the wrath of God or the anger of God being poured out. So we know that the context of this passage is the second coming of Jesus. And now keep reading that last verse text there for us the last reference verse 27 for thus says the lord the whole land shall be desolate yet i will not make a full end okay now i want you to take that phrase yet will i not make a full end mrs gloria i want you to just put it on the desk right there in front of you okay just put that phrase down and we're going to pick that phrase up and we're going to look at it in just a little bit it's at the second coming of jesus that this earth becomes like an abusos like without form and void, just like it was prior to creation, the cities are broken down. It is a desolate place. And Satan is here, suffering by thinking about what's going to be his final end. Notice what the, our graphic up here, the next slide. The second coming, the righteous are raised. At the second coming, the wicked are slain. At the second coming, the second coming starts the thousand years or the millennial period, and Satan is bound to earth. Is everybody clear so far? Is this, is this clear to us? Tom, you got it? Okay. When you draw a chart, 
It helps people to see the events when they're happening. Now, when I'm giving this Bible study in somebody's home, I'll actually take the references, and I'll put the references above this. I turn my paper not... Uh, may I borrow this? I turn my paper not like this when I'm taking the notes or while I'm giving the study. I turn it like this because I know I'm going to draw my chart across the center part right here, and then I'm going to have second coming up here with the text that show that, and then the wicked being slain down here with the text that show that, and then I've got my thousand-year line, and then a line going down that shows Satan being bound to this earth for a thousand years, and I've got my texts down there. Because when, when you do that, that's going to stick in somebody's mind in, in a much more forceful way than if they can't see it. So that's why you see that graphic up there. So you're taking notes, and uh, of course you have those graphics on our server here, and you can just get those off of that. So it is at the second of coming of Jesus that the earth is returned to the condition that it was in without form and void prior to creation. So Satan's just down here in a desolate world. Sounds like a pretty miserable place to be, huh, Bill? I tell you what, though, when the Lord comes, your hip won't bother you no more. Praise God. Pray, praise God. That's right. Let's go to our next slide. What are the righteous doing during the millennium? What are the wicked doing? What, you tell me. What are the wicked doing? They're dead. The wicked are dead during the millennium or the thousand years. What are the righteous doing? How do we know that? <laughs> well, let's go to our next slide. You're absolutely right, Roberto. Let's go to Revelation 20, verses 6, and then verse 4. Notice the order that it's in. We're going to read verse 6, then we're going to read verse 4. And you'll want to do that when you give the studies as well. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, and then verse 4. And Danielle, can you read this for us? Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Okay, hang on. Who is it that gets raised in the first resurrection? The righteous. Blessed and holy are the righteous, those that take part in the first resurrection. Keep going. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with Him a thousand years. Whoa! How long will they reign with Him? A thousand years. A thousand years. How long is Satan bound? A thousand years. The very same time period that the righteous live and reign with Christ, Satan is bound. That's pretty significant, isn't it? The very same time period Satan is bound, the righteous live and reign with Christ in heaven. All right, now go to verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So the righteous, those that live and reign with Christ for a thousand years, are sitting on thrones. Notice the first part of verse 4 said, Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. So what are the righteous doing on those thrones for that thousand-year period? They're judging. My question is, who are they judging? Who are they judging? The wicked. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians, that's to the left from the book of Revelation. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 2. And Tom, can you read this for us? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Go ahead and read verse 3 as well, Tom. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Okay, so we're going to be judging the world. And we're going to be judging what? Angels. Are we going to be judging the wicked angels or the good angels? The wicked angels. We're going to be judging the world, the righteous world or the wicked world? The wicked world. You and I are going to spend a thousand years sitting on a throne with Christ, having every question answered as to why our mom isn't here or our grandma or our papa our grandpa every question we have 
is going to be answered because God is going to give us the opportunity to look over all of those record books that have been kept throughout all of history past. And God is going to let us look at those. And then we're going to be able to come to God and we're going to be able to reason with Him. Isn't that what He said in Isaiah 1.18? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. So God is going to allow us that 1,000 year period of reviewing the books. Now, what's going to be in the books? What's going to be in those books? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. So we don't have to turn very far, Mike. If you would read this for us, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. Now, I will interrupt you several times here. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Okay, I'm interrupting you right there. Therefore, judge nothing before the what? Before the time. And then it describes the time, and that time is what? Until the Lord comes. Until the Lord comes. So you and I are not to be judging the world right now. We are not to be judging the angels right now. It says, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. So what's the event when the Lord comes? That's almost redundant to ask it that way, but... The second coming of Jesus, that's right. Now keep reading the, the rest of that verse, if you don't mind. Who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Now we can't just skip over what that verse said. That verse just said that every... It said it will, bring, it will make manifest the counsels of the heart. It will both... It will who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. It is during that thousand-year period where the saints sit with Christ and every evil thought, every evil deed, every malicious thought that screamed through our mind towards somebody else, if we have not asked forgiveness for it, if we are not in the host of the redeemed, all of that will be written down for the saints to see. I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that God has promised me that He would take my sins and throw them into the depths of the sea. Jesus has promised that He would take His blood and blot out all of my sins. I want to be a saint of the living God because I don't want any of you to know what I've done. Amen. My friends, you and I, you and I can make our decision for Christ today. Now notice, in, even in this study, we're not even anywhere near the end of this study, but I'm already starting to make that appeal. So when you give this study, you'll want to make sure that you begin to appeal early in the study. So if people will take small decisions all along the way, when it gets to the end of your study, and they make the, they'll make, it will make the big decision a lot easier. So Jesus is telling us right here in His Word that at His second coming, all of the wicked deeds of all of the wicked people will be laid out for the righteous to see. I'm not trying to scare anybody or terrify anyone. But it is a dreadful thought to know that if we are not in the kingdom, that we are going to, everything evil that we have ever done is going to be seen, who knows, by our mother, our grandma, our family, our friends. But Jesus, why isn't my husband here? And Jesus just opens the books. I can imagine that even at that point, Jesus will have tears in His eyes. And that's just me imagining. He says, well, this, this is why. Let me show you. And you'll just want to turn away from that and say, I don't want to read it. And Jesus says, but let me tell you, you have to be clear on this because we're going to get to live together for eternity. I don't want there to be any question in your mind because I'm going to wipe this out. This record is going to be gone. And we'll never remember it anymore. And so you and I will sit with Jesus and He will answer our questions. 
Let's go to our next reference. The next reference we have is in Psalm 149. And I'm excited about this reference because this reference right here tells me that the Bible is going to be the standard of the judgment of God. The Bible is going to be the standard even during that thousand year or that millennial time period. So we're going to Psalm 149, and we'll ask Mrs. Gloria to read this for us. Psalm 149, and then verse, we'll begin in verse 4. Psalm 149, verse 4. For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He will beautifully the humble with salvation. Beautify. I'm sorry. Yeah. Beautif- Let the saints be joyful in glory. Okay, stop right there. Mrs. Gloria, where are the saints? In glory. They're in glory. Notice there in verse 4, it said, The Lord takes pleasure in His people. He will beautify the meek or the humble with salvation. When is it that we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? When is that? Second coming of Jesus. So this is, at, this is after the second coming of Jesus because now the saints are in glory. Keep reading there. Verse 5. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Then continue. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Mrs. Gloria, what do they have in their hand? Two-edged sword. They have a two-edged sword. On the graphic, you'll notice on the screen on the graphic, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, and Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. Hebrews 4, 12, we won't take the time to read it right now. Hebrews 4, 12 says that the word of God is quick or alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Then if we read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, we would see the Bible tell us, it would say the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. So the saints are joyful in glory. They've been beautified with salvation in Psalm 149. They're in glory. They've been beautified with salvation. And they have a two-edged sword in their hand. Shalita, what is it that they have in their hand? The Word of God. The Word of God will be the standard for the judgment. You and I will either be in heaven, holding the word of God, looking at the evil, wicked deeds of men and comparing what they did with what the Bible said they could have or should have done. We'll be up there doing that or we will be judged by this book. We'll be judged by this book. We have a choice right now, Shalita, that we can make our decision to be on the Lord's side today so that we can make sure that we are in heaven with the saints, joyful in glory, in our beautiful, glorified bodies. We can make that choice today or we will be judged by this book during that thousand-year period. It's powerful, isn't it? Can you keep reading for us, Mrs. Gloria? To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples to bind their kings with chains and their noblemen with feathers of iron, to execute them with the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. So Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> what is the purpose of the saints having the two-edged sword or the word of God in their hand? To execute the written judgment. And where is it written, Tom? It's written in the Word of God. My friends, we can either live by the book now or be judged by the book later. What decision do you want to make today? Oh, you want to live by the book because you want to be in the city. And I'll tell you why you want to be in the city in just a minute. We're going to get there. Let's turn now to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, after our review. I have a review slide up here, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. At the second coming of Jesus, what happens to the righteous? They are raised. At the second coming of Jesus, what happens to the wicked? They're slain. And then that begins what time period? 
the millennium. Now, some people will say, well, how do we know since the 70 weeks was a prophetic time period, the 2300 days was a prophetic time period, how do we know that this is not a prophetic time period? That's a good question, isn't it? Isn't that a good question? You remember way back when we did our Word of God study, we went over John 14, 29. Jesus says, I tell you things before they come to pass so that when they do come to pass, you may what? Believe. Believe. So the purpose of a time prophecy that contains prophetic time is so that people can believe when it comes to pass, right? After the second coming of Jesus, is there any need for a prophetic time period? There's no need for a prophetic time period. So the only, we know that this is a literal thousand years because everybody that has believed is up in heaven. And they're there for that thousand year period. And something really interesting happens at the end of that thousand year period. Now, we will go to our next reference. We're going to go to our 12th reference, Revelation 20, verse 4b. That means the last half of verse 4 to 5a, or the first half of Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. So we're going to Revelation 20, verse 4b. And Mike, can you read this for us? I'm almost there. Maybe somebody else is just not turned there while I was talking like I did. Okay, Revelation 20, verse 4b and 5a. So just the very last part of verse 4. Uh, I don't know where you want me to start, but I'll All right, start and here. they lived. Which, How about that? Okay. And they lived... Uh, wait a minute. Just the very last sentence. Revelation 20? Yeah, 4b. Just the last part of verse 4. Oh, you got a different translation than I did. Which okay. had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. See, we have the same version. I have King James Version. What do you have? I got King James. All right. Praise All right. the Lord. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Who's this talking about? The it's talking about the righteous. Okay, now read the first part of verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So the rest of the dead. So the righteous live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Then it says, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years are finished. What does that mean? Pick up the microphone and tell me in a loud voice, Shalita. Somebody tell me in a loud voice with a microphone. What does it mean? The wicked that were dead before his second coming won't be alive until the end of the millennium. That's right. What about those that died at his second coming? Them too, right? So all of the wicked are dead at the second coming of Jesus. They die and or were dead or are dead. And then for a thousand year period, they're in the grave. The Bible says in Revelation 20 verse 5, but the rest of the dead, that would be the wicked, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years we're finished. So at the end of the thousand years, what will happen to the wicked that were dead? They'll raise again. That's absolutely right. We'll continue. I want to go back to our chart here. So if you just look back at the chart, the second, it's at the second coming that the righteous are raised. It's at the second coming that the wicked are slain. The thousand year millennial period begins at the second coming of Jesus. During that time period, Satan is bound by his chains of circumstance. Remind me, why is it that Satan was bound? There's nobody for him to tempt. That's absolutely right. So Satan is bound, beginning with the second coming, for a thousand years. Now, uh, Jessica, pick up that microphone and tell me what the righteous are going to do for that thousand year period. They're going to be with Jesus in heaven, judging. All right, and what will they have in their hands? The Bible. And what will they be judging? The wicked. That's right. Very, very nice. You, you knew that. You didn't have to ask it like a question. So the righteous live and reign with Christ in heaven for the same time period that Satan is bound. Then you go to the very last part of this graphic. It says Satan is released by the rest of the dead or the wicked being raised. 
Now, when Satan, when, when the rest of the dead are raised, what does that give Satan the opportunity to do? Deceive. You remember back in Revelation 20, verse 1, 2, and 3, we read that Satan was bound from deceiving, and he could deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. That's right. Now, Miss Gloria, do you remember what phrase you had sitting on your table, table there? What phrase did you have sitting there? No, ma'am. Anybody remember what phrase she had on her table? It was in uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 27. I will not... That's right. I will not yet make a full end. So we still haven't come back to that yet. I just wanted to make sure that you're ready to give it back to me when we're ready to reference it, okay? So you get ready. We're going to get back over there in just a minute. So Satan is released by the rest of the dead or the wicked being raised. Our next reference there, you'll see... Well, it's a question actually on the screen. When does the resurrection of the wicked take place? Answer that for me. At the end of the millennium, after the thousand years, and what is their end? What is the end of the wicked? And we have lots of references here that we're going to read in Revelation chapter 20. And just, you know, if you guys don't mind, I'll read that because, you know, it jumps around like crazy there. But uh, you pay close attention to it. We're in Revelation 20, verses 7, 8, and then 9a. Revelation 20, verse 7, 8, and then the first part of verse 9. Revelation 20, verse 7 says, And when the thousand years are expired... What does that word expired mean? Over, the end. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Now, what was it that bound Satan in his prison? There was no one to tempt. His chains of circumstance. All of a sudden, his circumstances are now changed and the chains fall off. Verse 8. And shall go out to what? Deceive. Jump back to verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more. Then over in verse 8 it says that he will go out to do what? To deceive. So we see that indeed the very thing that bound Satan at the beginning of the thousand years, that being that there's nobody to tempt, at the end of the thousand years or at the end of the millennium, there are people to tempt. The wicked dead have been raised and so Satan is no longer bound. Continue reading here. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And for every Christian that is hearing this read, this should bring an emotion to our hearts. Because these people that are wicked are numbered like the sand of the sea. Have you been to the beach lately? Have you seen how much sand is out there? We complain about the amount of sand that ends up in our floorboard of the car when we're going home. But when you have people that, whose number is as the sand of the sea that are lost, this should give you and I even gra an even greater push or motive to make sure that everyone has the chance to hear about Jesus. It says there in verse Eight, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. Who's the they? The wicked. And they're on the, the, the surface of what? The earth. So where was Satan bound? The on the earth, that's right. And compassed the camp of the saints about. So we're through to 9a. Now we're going to go to verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. 
And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their what? Works. My friend, don't ever let anybody tell you that the works that you do as a Christian are not important. You and I are certainly saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. But we are judged by our works. Judged by our works. Don't let anyone ever tell you, friend, that it doesn't matter what you as a Christian act like or talk like or do or the places you go because we are judged by our works. Saved by grace through faith but judged by our works. They are continuing on. We were in verse... Where were we at? We were in verse 13. And there, every man was judged according to their works. Now go back up to verse 9b, or the second half. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Who did the fire devour? It devoured the wicked. Now, you know, I have, I have teenage boys. And teenage boys are notoriously good at eating. You wait. When your boy hits teenage years, whatever he's eating now is going to be quadrupled. It's going to be exponential. And when my boy sits down to eat dinner, he devours it. I don't even think he chews. He's like a hound dog sometimes. He doesn't even chew it. It just all of a sudden is in there. But it's gone. The plate is clean. Nothing is left. And the Bible says that at the end of the millennium, when those righteous people stand before God, not the righteous, the wicked people stand before God, the righteous stand with God, the wicked people are standing before God, they're trying to take the city, Satan convinces them they can take it, but they can't, and fire comes down from heaven, out of heaven, from God, and devours them. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You see, my friends, everybody dies now. The righteous person dies, the wicked person dies, but only the wicked person dies the second death. And you and I can avoid that death by making a simple choice today, by making the choice to love the truth of God. Is that your desire? Oh, praise Jesus. I have here on the, let's read verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. On your screen there, you'll see in our next reference this graphic. At the second coming, the righteous are raised. At the second coming, the wicked are slain. The thousand years begins at the second coming of Jesus. Satan is bound to the earth because there's no one to tempt. The righteous live and reign with Christ in heaven for a thousand years. At the end of the millennium, Satan is released by the rest of the dead or the wicked being raised. The great white throne judgment, the wicked stand before God. They are judged according to their works. And then fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours the wicked. But you remember what Jesus said. There in, back in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 27, he says, Yet will I not make a full end. Now, my friends, God is going to make a full end. He is going to make a full end. The Bible tells us that the righteous will inherit the earth. Let's go to our next reference there, Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. And now since we're in the appeal, I'll be the one that reads these. You know, we've talked about that in the past, that when you're giving the appeal... You want to make sure that you are the one that, that has the, the pathos in your voice, that you have all the mannerisms that you want to go with those verses. Because remember, you are appealing to people on behalf of God. So the Bible says here, Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What earth? Are they going to, are the meek? Those that are blessed, those that are beautified with salvation, are they going to inherit this old earth that's been broken down? No, no, no. They're going to inherit a new heaven and a new earth. And we see this in our next reference up there. Let's go to Revelation 21. 
I think I may have a mistake right there. Let me just back up a little bit. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. I just shot right past that, didn't I? So we're going to 2 Peter before we go to Revelation 21. So let's go to 2 Peter. It's past Corinthians, past Hebrews. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. The meek will not inherit this old dirty world. They're going to inherit something much more grand than that. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. My friend, God has promised the meek the humble, that they would inherit the earth. But He's not going to give them a sour gift. He's going to give them a new heaven and a new earth. Our next reference here is Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. He says, John says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things, what's the word? New. New. Right, for these words are true and faithful. God is going to make all things new. Turn with me back to the Old Testament book, our last reference. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9. God is going to make a full end. So Nahum is to the right of Daniel Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9. It says, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. God will not allow sin to ever reign again. You and I have a decision today to choose to live by the book or be judged by the book. What decision will you make?